I'm going to pick up from last week and last week we talked about what we need to learn so I want to make it interactive if possible so if anybody's got anything they want to add or say or they've thought about since um, that would be really good um, so the first thing I want to do is just recap for those um, who well just for all of us really so we had three points that we made last week about what we need to learn can anybody remember what the first one was what was the first thing we said last week Anybody remember? So we said we were going over Elder Tess's notes for the benefit of those who weren't here. And we were summarising the points she made at the camp meeting, the French camp meeting. And the, one of the first things she said about Adam and Eve um, in the Garden of Eden was that they were created in a certain way, with a certain mind. Can anybody remember what the first point was? I know it's been a long week. <laughs> Do we need some help? Created to learn. Created to learn. So they were created to to have an increase of knowledge. Uh, let's put, I'll put to learn. Have an increase of knowledge. And can you give us an example? Anybody? How do we know they were created to have an increase of um, knowledge? Come on. I do. Um, the angels came down to teach him certain things. Um, I'm not sure if he knew how to garden. I don't know if you read a quote where he was taught how to garden, and, and he's learning more about God to the creation, learning about the animals, learning about... Um, so although he was created perfect, he still had to learn things. Amen. So, so yeah, he was created with a perfect mindset, fully reflecting the thoughts of God. So we read that quote where it said, they, they reflected the thoughts of God, they thought like God did. When the animals came to be named, they called them what God would have named them and what Adam did. And But she also read a quote, as you say, about gardening. So they were to taught how to tend the garden. He didn't know automatically how to tend the garden. And so that was something he was taught. Another thing that was pointed out was that he didn't know he was lonely until he saw the animals. And as the animals went before him, he recognised that he didn't have a companion by his side, that he was lonely, that he needed socialization and support, just like the animals did, that he felt that need. And he only felt that need when he saw in front of him his environment and he recognized his condition then. So this is something he had to grow to learn. And I think this is really important. And we said, so we are always learning. We're always getting an increase of knowledge. And we can never say all we see, what we see, sorry, I was getting this wrong, what we see is all there is. So this is something we have to, um, this reflex brain is something we have to override continually, that we have to continually be increasing our knowledge and never think that we've arrived. And this is, we said this last week, that the problem that we all have is that we have a mindset where we've arrived. So through history we've seen that as we Baptist, Methodist, each church that came along or each increase of light that God gave, they stopped and said, we'll stay Baptist with baptism. Methodist came along and said, let's add Methodism. And the Baptist said, no, no, we're, we're okay. We've got baptism by immersion. We don't need that. So they put up a barrier. Every increase of knowledge, we had a new denomination, and that wasn't God's will. Because people said, all we have now, we're comfortable with. That's okay. And we use the same reasoning with our fathers. You know, they had the Sunday. Sunday was good enough for them. Sabbath comes along and say, we don't need the Sabbath because we've, had, we've got Sunday. So... We have, we have this line in the sand, so we get to a certain point and we say we're going to stop learning now when we should have been increasing for 6,000 years. So the other thing we factored in last week is we should have been increasing in knowledge, in positive knowledge of good. But unfortunately what happened is evil came in and because of evil coming in, now we have to unlearn. So we've got an increase of knowledge, but this knowledge includes what we have to unlearn. So we have to unlearn and learn again. And that's the problem we're in, is that we have accepted truth and error. And now we have to unlearn the error and continue to grow in the truth. So Adam and Eve would have been 6,000 years down the line now in a knowledge of good. And they would never have had to unlearn anything. They would never have done anything evil. They would never have experienced evil. Now they would have known about the fall of Satan. So they would have had some concept of evil but not from their own experience. And I think this is what the tree of knowledge of good and evil was. It was 
an, um, a symbol that if you taste this, you're going to experience evil. And God never wanted us to experience evil. And so what we saw was we have to increase in knowledge of good and evil now. We have to, uh, we have to see truth and error. And we have to unlearn what the error is, and we have to learn the truth again. And this is a continual process unfolding before us, that as we keep increasing, we keep seeing more about evil as well as about good. So this is really important that we have to continue to learn, and what we see is not all there is. We have to continually bypass the reflex brain and go to the reasoning powers and say, you know, let's reason beyond what we see and, and our circumstances and recognize the principle behind it. So we said about principle and policy, we have to understand the principle and how the policy changes down through time. So we have to understand the principle. And that's versus policy. So what was the second thing we said we have to learn, we need to learn, which has been a key theme of our camp meetings for some time now and recognizing that how is God now going to teach us? How are we going to learn these things? Because what we saw in the garden was that they lost face-to-face -face communion with God. So the way Adam and Eve were to learn was to behold nature. So in nature, they were to see his character revealed, but also to speak with God face-to-face. -face. And we saw that at the fall, two things that happened. One was they were cut off so they're cut off from God, and nature was now marred. So she said nature no longer fully reflected the character of God. It was marred and defiled. And that nature, I was saying, was, wasn't just their environment, but it was each other as well. So it was everything he had created, man and the animals and the plants, all were now defaced or marred by sin. So now when they looked at each other, they didn't see a complete picture of God. And when they looked at nature, they didn't see a complete picture of God. But there was enough in there for them to learn and grow still. But it wasn't as good as it would have been. And, it, and they lost the face-to-face -face communion. So now God's got a problem because he can't talk to them face-to-face. -face and nature is not giving a correct picture. So how are they going to understand who he is? Because fear took the place of love. So we saw this um, battle now between love and fear. And so now the, the minute that God comes to them in the garden, they're running from him to hide. And they're saying, no, no, we can't face him. We're afraid now. We think he's going to kill us. He's a bad God. He's a horrible God. Whereas before, they ran to meet him. And they were embraced his presence every day. And now they ran away from him. So there's this divide. There's this gulf that needs reconciling now. So now God's got a problem. They hate, they're afraid of him. They hate him. And the minute he now tries to do something to help them, they're justifying themselves. They're... Um, attacking each other, they are the dynamics have changed in their relationships, and it's it's destroyed their relationship, but it's also destroyed their relationship with God. So we've got that two-way loss, I guess. And um, we didn't say that last week. I'm just thinking now as we're talking, as we're talking more about it. But he's got a problem. So now, how can he reach us? What was the second second thing we talked about? What does God do to tell people about Himself? Anybody? What do we say he uses now? So he didn't use it for the first 2,000 years, perhaps. <laughs> so, but what do we have? What's the only way that we can really get to know God? I, well, it's not the only way. We're learning more in the message, but what's the only way we used to think about Venice that we can get to know God? Who's there? Sister Debbie, are you there? Pick on your own No, maybe she's not there. Sister Phoebe, are you there? Yes, she just do people. People, but what before we had this equality message, or before we had this m more recent message about love your brother, what would we have said that you'd get to know God? How do you get to know God? Through what? Through his word. Through his word. So now he gives his word. And another way of putting that would be a message. So then we said he sends a message through people. And the way he gave us that word was through people. So we had prophets, uh, which he calls the Bible. For us, it's the Bible and spirit prophecy. 
So we have Ellen White's writings. So we have these things and we recognize that these are now dead, but we also have living messengers, dead and living. So what I was thinking about this morning as well, I, I, did, um, I think this is really significant because what we do is we go back to this and we say, we've got his word, it's a complete picture. And people will stop at the Bible and they'll say, we've got the Bible, that's all we need. This is the full truth about God and everything we need is in the Bible. And then we as Adventists come along and say, no, actually, we've had an increase of knowledge. We've got the spirit of prophecy. And even some Adventists won't factor this in. They'll say, no, it's not on a level with the Bible. It's not inspiration. It's not the same. Um, but a lot of people, but everybody who accepts spirit of prophecy will say, Ellen White's an increase of knowledge. This is the same as the Bible. It's the, the word of God speaking to us. So that is God speaking. So we were taught equals God speaking. But what's the test for every generation? <laughs> the test for every generation isn't the dead people, it's the living people. So now we're in the judgment of the living, and we're seeing more and more that it's all about those who are alive, not those who are dead. So we build on those that are dead, that's true enough. We have all this writing, this body of truth that's a foundation for us, but now it becomes imperative that we understand how to read it. And the only way you can understand how to read it is if you listen to the living messenger in your history. So present truth, I'm going to say, we always know, we always quote this as Adventists, as conservatives, present truth is what the flock needs, not precious truth from the Old Testament. So these are all precious truths, but present truth is what the flock needs. And the only way we get present truth is through a living messenger. And that's always the test in every dispensation. They're tested on how they accept the living messenger in their time. So Ellen White's time, they're tested by Ellen White. Do you accept that Ellen White is a prophet? And look how many people struggled to um, accept that Ellen White was a prophet. And then, and then as we go down through history, people th through the time of Adventism, many people have rejected Ellen White, have not been able to accept that she's the messenger for the time, and they'll, they'll reject her and end up rejecting the whole of Scripture because they're rejecting the voice of God in their history. So present truth is what the people need. It's a living messenger who always comes with a message that confronts the people with their established ideas. So they think what we see is all there is. We've got Bible, we've got Ellen White, we don't need any more. And now someone comes along and says, no, you need more. And every time someone does that, people go, no, what we see is all there is and all we want. We don't want any more. We don't want to grow. We don't want an increase of knowledge. And they fall off the path because they're not willing to keep on going up the path. And this is really important. So connected with this thought, we've learning in our history is how reader style. So we can see how, how what Elder Tess and Elder Pamindra are talking about is linking together when we, when we look at it like this, how they're developing the same thought, but it's different angles perhaps. So we need an increase of knowledge. Um, so if, we, if we're going to summarize them, we could remember them this way. We need an increase of knowledge. All the time we need an increase of knowledge. So what we see is not all there is. And we need to understand how to understand or read that increase of knowledge. How, to, how that increase of knowledge impacts how we read the word that's gone before. So we've read the word, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, in a certain way. We've reached to a certain point and we've said all, you know, what we see is all there is. We've made a position on certain things and we've stuck there. Then a living messenger comes along and says, how read us thou now? They deliver a message. It challenges us. Now we have to go back and see, like the Bereans, if their message fits with what we already understand. And then we recognize that what we already understand isn't quite correct. We haven't interpreted it in the right way. We haven't read it in the right way for our time. So now we have to go back and look at it and fit it together in our time. So as we see this increase of knowledge, it's not just we're standing here and we get light shining on the future, but we get light shining on the past. And we're familiar with this imagery because of the midnight cry vision. So we get the midnight cry shining all the way along the path. We know that light is coming from Jesus, who is at the end of the path. So we have um, Jesus saying, come up higher at this end. Sorry about the pictures. And um, we're in the middle and we're looking and we're thinking, okay, we have to look to Jesus for further light. But as we get that further light, it shines back on the path. So we always have light from the past and the future guiding us. So now we get a message of equality 
And now we're looking to the future as to what's that test going to look like that we're going to be tested on. But as we look back, we'll see that equality is all through scripture and we see a line of progression. So we have to understand that when we get this increase of knowledge, it's not just future, which is how we always conceptualize prophecy, was it was knowledge about the future. But this is knowledge about the past as well. And the past will have increased light on the future because we'll see that the message is established in the past and we've got light and evidence from the past that we can stand upon to guide us for the future. So we keep getting this increase of knowledge on the past and on the future and about good and evil so we can understand what truth is and what error is. So how readest thou was the second thing we learned. So we've, we've been given a message now through living preachers and through the written word and we have to understand it in the right way. And then the third thing we learned what was the third thing? Can anybody remember? Oh, there was a quote I wanted to put in, actually. Uh, so I wanted to remind us as well about Great Controversy, but we'll go there in a minute. Let's look at the third thing. So what's the third thing? So Satan has basically successfully um, derailed the program. And we're seeing how he's done that by marring nature, by cutting us off from God, then he comes along and he gets us to read the word wrongly. So we've misinterpreted scripture, we've misinterpreted Ellen White. And the way he's done that now is to get us to hold on to the past and to stop and say what we see is all there is and not be willing to grow. And the way that materializes in our history is we hold on to a false view of God, an idolatrous picture of God. So we have held on to idolatry. So what we talked about then was character and form uh, in connection to idolatry. And this whole concept comes from the fact that Satan thinks, well, if they're going to get to know God now, first of all, he doesn't want anyone to know God, because if they know God, they can trust him and be saved, and Satan doesn't want anyone to be saved. And so he doesn't want us to have a relationship with God, so he wants us to be afraid and not have love. And we learned last week from, I think this was a quote from Great Controversy, but let's just put that in there. I think this is a quote you really need to be familiar with. There's a lot in this quote. This is Great Controversy. Hello? Yes. Okay. I was just thinking that, oh, I think that's like the nature of man. Character, the first part. And um, form is the second part, habit. And it's come at the right time. Um, second part, nature of man. I mean, I was about to minister just started it, and then it seems like Elder Tess is continuing the nature of man, because the form is the outside of the man, where the character is the inside. Yes, it's a good point. I think nature of man is a crucial study that we know is unfolding, because it's all about our in, uh, who we are and our interaction with each other, if we understand how man works. And so I think this is a, it's, it's a good point that the form and the character, the form is the outward, is how we behave and the character is the inward so it's kind of outer man inner man as the actions and then the mindset and so we see that with this they've got the wrong view of god and they're making a false image of god in front of them so they've got visible form and they've got a mindset that's wrong towards god and so now we're making a distinction because we recognize in the history of the israelites that they had this form apis bull that they carried on a mindset of apis bull from egypt but they also made the golden calf so they had an image of god and then gradually through time they get rid of the image, they get rid of the outward form, but they hold on to the mindset. And this is a really um, crucial to understand as well, how we've done the same, how we hold on to this false view of God from apostate Protestantism. And obviously the Israelites got it from the Egyptians, we've got it from apostate Protestantism. And it's getting, and the track of error is getting closer to the track of truth because these are professing Christians now, whereas Egyptians never professed the true God. They were always false gods, they were always not the true God, and the Israelites should have been distinct. Um, and gradually the Israelites got rid of that false picture, but they held on to the mindset. And now we come down to our time, we have Christians who have got a wrong view of God. But we saw last week how Satan had done that, how Satan seeks to do that through time. So if we get this, this quote, it's a great controversy, and it's 569.1. I just want to read it again, um, because I think it's worth pulling out the points just before we move on to the next section. So we're really looking at what we need to learn, and this was a foundation for what we need to learn in our history now about equality and empathy. That's where we ended up last week with empathy. 
So we'll go there in a minute, but we'll just want to read this quote again. So um, if someone's got that, it's GC 569.1. They could read it for me or put it in the chat. And then I'll pick up some points from it. Oh, I can put it in. No, it is Satan's constant effort. 569.1. I've just put it in the chat. Do you want to read that, Natalie? Have you got it? Well, you can't hear me. Can you hear me? Brother Debray, are you there? Do you want to read it? Everyone's quiet today. <laughs> what about Brother Richard? Are you there? Sorry, what are you reading? Hi, could you, Brother Kitty. Yeah. A GC 569.1 is in the thread. Okay, two seconds. Good morning. Yeah, five six nine point one. It starts. It is Satan's constant effort. I can't if you want to go into something. Um, yeah, it is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law, and gives men license to sin. At the same time, he causes them to cherish false conceptions of God so that they regard him with fear and hate rather than with love. The cruelty inherent in his own character is attributed to the Creator. It is embodied in the systems of religion and expressed in modes of worship. Thus the minds of men are blinded, and Satan secures them as his agents to war against God. By perverted conceptions of the divine attributes, even nations were led to believe human sacrifices is necessary to secure the favor of the divine, and horrible cruelties have been per perpetrated under the various forms of idolatry. So there's a lot in here, and one of the things we need to understand is the great controversy between good and evil. And so this is why we have the book, Great Controversy, because we see that the increase of knowledge includes an increase of knowledge of Satan, because we need to know our enemy to overcome him. And we see in our history this two streams of information, this warfare, information warfare between Satan's stream and God's stream. And so we have to see this distinction between truth and error. So here we see Ellen White is unmasking Satan to us. And she's telling us, she's giving us warning that there's three things. That his constant effort is to misrepresent the character, of, is to misrepresent several things. So Satan is always trying to do this to us. And we have to recognize the warfare we're in. So the first thing Satan's trying to do is what it's a constant effort to misrepresent the character of God. So we've got him misrepresenting several things. The first thing is the character of God. And we saw how that happened straight away in the Garden of Eden. So now Adam and Eve, instead of loving God and trusting him and depending upon him and seeing his um, his goodness, they are afraid of him. They think he's horrible and cruel and, and um, their, this fear drives them away from him and separates them. You see, um, Emma. Yes. You see that 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 being the case with um, a lot of people in secular countries, um, or around the world, per se, in the sense that, so like in America, for example, evangelicals, just as that example, secularists will look at Christianity and say, if that's Christianity, or they won't even put the if, they'll say, I don't want to be Christian because your God is homoph homophobic is etc etc so satan does a twofold he misrepresents god to the individual and then uses those people to misrepresent god to those around so those around then don't want to know that god and end up hating him yeah which is tragic okay. so that the character of god is marred all through the world in these different false religions in the way that they run governments 
even the way Christian governments, like you say, the evangelical Christian, evangelical far right mindset is putting people off God. And that's Satan's intention. He just wants the character of God to be marred everywhere. So that if they do know about God, they don't want to serve him because he's a nasty God. And um, and this is his his constant attempt through time and through um, through the whole earth. He also misrepresents the nature of sin. So he wants to represent the misrepresent the nature of sin. So he tells people that they can live in sin and go to heaven. Um, it's okay, you don't have to keep law. So we can see that in his constant attack on God's law that he doesn't want people to be obedient. So he violates the Sabbath, he violates the marriage vows, he violates he, he tries to break every single one of those laws so that people will not understand the nature of sin. And then those yeah, people that, go on. Like the like the FDA so you can't be perfect. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, you can't be perfect. So there's this, there's there's like two or three ditches you can go into. So you can, if you don't believe you will be perfect or you can stop sinning, you won't stop sinning. And that's what Ellen White says. And so, because you don't even know what sin is, if you don't know what sin is, you can't stop it. If you know what it is, he'll try and get you to magnify, um, to say you can't do it. So they they know it's wrong to steal and kill, but somehow Christ's righteousness is going to cover us, and we can still keep doing those things. But then the other ditch that we see now for conservative Adventism is that. We, didn't really, we don't really understand what sin is because we focused on the minors instead of the majors. Just like the Pharisees, we make these laws, we, we stand on the traditions of men, or we stand on a reading of scripture which isn't correct. And so, for example, the, the trousers and the skirt, we think it's a sin to wear trousers in one, in one level. And then we get this message unfolding that actually you've interpreted scripture wrong, you've applied it wrong, you've elevated it above where it should be, and now you've got to come back and say, no, actually... It's not wrong to wear trousers. Let's change that. So he he wants us to focus on the, in the wrong direction and make a law out of that when it's not a law. And so so we start we don't know what sin is anymore. So we blur the edges and we say, well, you know, we and we uplift things and guard them at the expense. What we're learning in this history at the expense of loving people. So we put um, different man-made traditions or laws above, and we say they're sin. And so we we really don't know what the nature of sin is. And That's because um, they, the Millerites rejected the third angel's message, which was righteousness by faith. That was the third angel's message in 1888. Yes. They rejected how to become righteous. And the same with this movement, not the whole movement, but FFA, gang. They rejected the nature of man in 2017, which is also to perfect righteousness. Exactly, yes. Which is all yes. about the nature of sin. So those that believe they can be righteous, so most people in the world think you can't be righteous, and a lot of people in the church think you can't be righteous, but those that think you can be righteous, he shows us, he doesn't show us, he blurs how to be righteous, he blocks that path, and says, no, you can't be righteous that way, do it this way, and it's not the, it's obviously not the correct way, and you can't be righteous that way, it's by works and not by faith, it's not by trusting in God's living message for the hour, it's doing it what people have always done, or... Yeah, it's refusing that increase of knowledge which is going to enable you to be righteous. So we can see how he's misrepresented the nature of sin, even in our history, and the nature of the test that's coming. And that's the next thing. It says the real issues at stake in the great controversy. So he wants to misrepresent the real issues at stake in the great controversy. And for our time, we know that's the Sunday law. So he's, he's made us focus on the Sunday law and say that's the issue at stake, that's the test, that's the be all and the end all. What we see is all there is. It's always going to be that because Ellen White will stand till the end and her books prepare us for the end times and it is a thus saith the Lord. Therefore we can't change it. But with our tech, with our methodology, so here I think how Reader Star includes methodology. So we see that with parable methodology, um, we can see that history repeats, we learn from line upon line and parable teaching that we've misunderstood the test for our time and we see that now the Sunday that the great controversy the book becomes a parable just like the whole of the old testament these are parable lessons for us to learn from and so we need to use parable methodology to understand what that's teaching us and not say that the policy or the application in her time when she wrote that now becomes the principle it's not the principle so what's the principle in our time and what do we need to see so what's what is the real issue at stake now for us in the great controversy when we're living? And Satan has blurred that successfully by getting us all to believe that a real Sunday law is coming. So he does that by, atta he attacks the doctrines of the church here. 
because he knows he's got most of the world, so he has to attack the doctrines of the church. So then it says, his sophistry lessens the obligation of divine law and gives man license to sin. So in the world, he just says, you know, you don't, don't bother about the law, you don't have to keep that, you can sin and go to heaven. At the same time, he causes them to cherish false conceptions of God, so they regard him with fear and hate rather than with love. So we had that here, we had love versus fear stroke hate. And so this is the root of the great controversy. Is, is God a loving God, or is he a fearful, hateful God, in which case we will become like that or like that. So we'll reflect that love or we'll reflect that fear and that hatred. And we see in our history that racism, nationalism, homophobia, all come from a position of fear and hate, because all prejudice stems from fear. So the fear of the, someone else is going to take your position, they're going to take your things, they're going to attack you and hurt you, and that comes from a wrong concept of the character of God. And that's Satan's design. The cruelty inherent in his own character is attributed to the Creator. It is embodied in systems of religion and expressed in modes of worship. So we talked about this last week, that his, this cruelty in, in Satan, um, he seeks to paint um, God in that image. So he seeks to get people to see God as cruel when he's cruel. So he, he misplaces the truth with error, and it's, it's direct opposite. So he's saying, God's the cruel one, and then he, what he does is, he embodies that in systems of religion. So he puts that, embodies it, to put it in a body of religion. So he gets the Catholic Church, Islam, he gets these false, he gets all religions, and he says, let's make God a cruel God at the heart of that system. So he puts that into religion. It doesn't say here Christian religion, but it says, um, he embodies it in systems of religion and in modes of worship. So there's types of worship, which is what, you know, by works, by appeasing this angry God, you have to go and say so many prayers, you have to pay arms, you have to do all these things to appease an angry God. And that's at the root of most religions, um, whether it's, you know, whichever one, false religions. But unfortunately, it's become into the, it's come into the Christian church as well. So the Christian church should have been distinct. It should have had this right view of God but he's got it to be embodied in professionally Christian churches as well. So it's in all f false religions and Christianity as well. Thus the minds of men are blinded and Satan secures them as his agents to war against God. So by perverted conceptions of the divine attributes, heathen nations were led to believe that human sacrifices were necessary to secure the favour of deity. So he gets the heathen nations, the one that don't profess to believe in God, so Egypt, you know, the Philistines, all the, the Amorites, all the Ites in the Bible, they all believe that you have to sacrifice your children now because they believe this cruel God needs to be appeased by cruel deeds, by um, horrific things. And human sacrifices were necessary and horrible cruelties have been perpetuated under the various forms of idolatry, perpetrated, sorry. So that means that it always leads to uh, wicked deeds and persecution and killing and hate is always the fruit of this view of God, this distorted view of God. So he seeks to get everyone to wipe each other out, to not reflect the character of God, so nobody wants to be saved and no one can be saved because they're behaving in a way that's not like God, they're not in his image anymore. They can't go to heaven with that character and Satan knows that. So it's his, always his studied effort to get people to have fear and hatred instead of love and that's at the root of idolatry. And so if we put um, this is idolatry, because idolatry, all that means is that you have a false god, an idol, and you worship that false god. And this false concept of God is that he's filled with fear and hate. He's a cruel god, so you're going to have fear and hate towards him. And then, um, and that's that's why idolatry is bad. It's not because so much there's an image there they're worshiping. It's not a living god. It's a dead god as well. That's the other thing. It's not the living. It's not living. And it's filled with death, fear and hatred, which is death. And life is comes from love. So he knows that we can't have eternal life if we don't have the love of God. Um, and we won't be happy there, and we'll end up killing each other again, so it's just not going to work. So basically, he, he needs to get us to have idolatry. Because if we have idolatry, we'll have this spirit, we'll have a horrible spirit about us, we'll be cruel, and we'll perpetuate, perpetrate wicked acts continually. And so that's what he's done. He set up false systems, systems of worship, false religion, and even apostate and fake Christianity, to put people off the Christian God, to put people off Christ. And so now we come into our history and we recognise that we've got idolatry. And how sick is that? 
Because if we've got idolatry, that means we've got cruelty, fear, hatred. We haven't got love at the heart of our religion, our religious system, even in the movement, which is sickening. Because the only people on earth who God can use to finish this are people in this movement. And we've recognised that we've got idolatry. So we've seen that we've got a form from apostate Protestantism and we've got the mindset. And now we're getting rid of the form and that started with the shedding the skirts and wearing the trousers as an outward symbol and putting women into positions of ministry now. So we see that the form is being shed by placing women in leadership and um, ordaining as elders and using them as teachers and restoring their place in the marriage. So getting rid of the headship model. So what we've done is we have um, women leaders. Um, we have no headship. Um, no skirts, no, I shouldn't say no skirts. We're going to wear trousers, <laughs> trousers for women. And all that is the form. But now we're finding that we still have the wrong mindset. So the character or the mindset, so that's this one, is um, we find that we've got racism, nationalism, same, similar thing, patriotism, and sexism, and homophobia. So we recognise that we still haven't let go of this idolatry of apostate Protestantism. So this is what we need to wrestle with. We need to wrestle with how do we get rid of this mindset to be ready to see God in the right way, to understand his character, what the nature of sin is, and what our test is in our time period, we really need to wrestle with how we change this mindset. So let's just clear the board. I'm going to summarise it by putting increase of knowledge. So we've got increase of knowledge. The word, which is how we look down. And the third thing is this character and form. So how do we change the mindset? And this is this is what we're all wrestling with. And I think I want to bring it in now to the to link it to Elder Perminder's Academy. So these principles were basically brought out by Elder Tess. And then Elder Perminder focused, I would say a big focus was homeschooling. Now, I know this isn't relevant to everybody, but I just want to put this up here in the middle for a minute. Homeschooling. And you think, what has that got to do with this issue? So, relevant to everybody, it's the actual concept behind the meaning of homeschooling. How, what we thought about what Spirit's Prophecy said about it, uh, you know, synecdoche and stuff, ha not looking at the whole picture indoctrinated by a conservative of FDA idolatry. You know, it's the whole concept behind what homeschooling means. It's not just about homeschooling, so it's very good for me as well. I don't have kids. Right, exactly. And I've been thinking about this in the last, especially since the county finished, because I think it's it obviously challenged a lot of parents. I've been talking to parents. It's challenged a whole worldview about, um, and, and at the heart of this, of homeschooling, is education. And, you know, there's a whole book by Ellen White. If anyone hasn't read that book, I thoroughly recommend it. But the book, Education, because education is what this movement is going through. Increase of knowledge is all about education. Education is a learning process. It's how to train, how to disciple, how to, um, and all those things are what we as priests are going to have to do. So. The parents with the children, to me, this is a parable. So it's this concept of education that we're, we're, we're challenged with. So the parents, I would say, are the priests. And the children are the potential. They could be priests as well, actually, but they're Levites. At the moment, they are priests because we're training each other. So, and the Nephilim. And as the parents are feeling this weight of responsibility now, because when you make decisions about how to educate your children, that's going to affect them, not just for now, but for eternity. 
And those principles are going to be that you instill in them or the way you teach them is going to decide whether they are going to make a major factor in whether they're saved or lost. So your responsibility is huge when you're making these decisions. So you're thinking, you're looking at children going, is it better for them to stay at home or go to state school? Is it better for them to have this teacher or me as a teacher? You know, and, and these um, concepts are really challenging because of our conservative mindset that we now have to get rid of. So the same way we're approaching homeschooling now, we approach the vows back in the beginning of the year. You know, or, or last year when we went through the shaking and the movement split and we had the baptismal vows and people were going into false freedom we were deciding, you know, do we throw the whole lot out or do we keep it some conservative, what's conservative value and get rid of the mindset? And so we shifted the mindset and we said, okay, it doesn't mean we don't dress modestly or we don't still eat vegan or we don't keep Sabbath or all those things we kept hold of, but now we've shifted the mindset. So I'm looking at this thing. I don't necessarily think we should throw out homeschooling, but we recognize that we as conservative parents, conservative priests have damaged our children. And we potentially damaged Levites, Nethanims, and priests. We've damaged people in the world. We've damaged our brethren on our false uh, and in the world. So we've damaged both the church and the world because of our false view of God, our conservatism. Now we have to get rid of that and decide what do we keep and how do we keep it. And I think that's this is why it's a good parable for what's going on. And it's all about human relationships. It's all about the family because homeschooling is about the family and the family school. And do you do it in the home or outside the home? How does it work? How do we interact with each other? So this is a, a really big challenge at this time for parents. So please keep parents in your prayers, but also recognize that priests have to, to know how to train and teach. And this is exactly what the parents are doing. How do we teach these children the best way? Because we're still teachers. Even if we send them to school, half the time they're at school, half the time they'll be with us. So we're sharing the teaching now with someone else. But we're still teaching and we're still responsible at the end of the day for the salvation of our children on one level. Um, and just like we're going to be responsible for the salvation of the Levites and the Nephilim. So if we don't get this right, if we don't understand how to teach and what to teach, we're going to fail the mission. And this is all connected to how successful our mission is going to be. We know it's going to be successful because we're in a line of success. But how successful will it be if our mindset is not in the right place? So this is a really important discussion. And it's challenging how we educate, what our focus of education is, what our focus of God is, who he is, and how to train the children in what God is like and how to teach children what God is like. Because if we can teach it to children, we can teach the Levites and the Nephilim. So this is why it's good training ground, I think, this whole discussion. And I to have empathy for others. So what came out of it last week was empathy. So in my further discussions outside of the class time with... Um, other Paminda primarily, but then other parents as well, is basically that if you only teach one thing to your children in this time period, it's this. So if they do not understand empathy, they are not passing this test, and neither are we. And so last week we started to look at this concept of empathy and what we need to learn. So in this, in, in this discussion about homeschooling, one of the key points that came out was that we children are born with empathy just like we were, and it's crushed out of us. And I think many of us, if we've come from a non-Adventist background, we know that when we were in the world, we were actually nicer, I think. And we didn't have, like many of us have said, we didn't have a problem with homosexuals in the world. We didn't have a problem with equality. Um, many of us were probably quite feminist. I was actually quite getting into equality issues. I, had, I kept a diary. And before I became Adventist, I was 23 at the time. We traveled the world, my sister and I. We began to see how women were oppressed and how they were kept down by, by marriages and in bondage. And we didn't want to be that kind of woman. We wanted to be one who said, we can do anything. We can do a career. We can do what we want. And we saw feminist arguments in the news, and I had cut out, cut and pasted stuff in my diary. So I could see that we were being awakened to equality issues. And then we come into the movement, we come into Adventism, sorry, and we accept this whole headship concept of the male over the female, and we put on the skirt and we say, okay, let's submit. And 20 years of conservative submission now has drummed out empathy from us. And so what that does is it sets up this standard of conservatism which drives out this empathy. And we've done the same with our children. And I don't know if when he said that he meant people in the world have done it too, that children are born with empathy and we drive it out of them. But I think conservative Protestantism is the worst at doing that. So we've got this wrong view of God now. Go on. Uh, sorry for the background noise, but um, I was going to ask, what are examples in which uh, parents do that with their children, as in drive that out in their children? 
Do you have examples of illustrations? I think I've been thinking about this further. We, we looked last week at what empathy was, and empathy is being able to sympathise with someone else's suffering, someone else's um, problem. Um, but it's also being able to put yourself in their shoes. It's more than sympathy. It's actually identifying with how they feel and um, really feeling their pain with them so that you can move them now to a position of safety, I suppose, or help them in some way. Because you can say, I'm sorry that you're sad, you know, and then talk, go on to the next thing. Or you can say, you know, I'm really sorry how you feel. That must be terrible to be in that situation. If I was there, how would I feel? And then you can actually say, I think we're going through this time of trouble now so that we can identify our anxieties, our issues, and overcome them. And then when we go to the leave and their things, we can say, you know what, I know how you feel because I've been there and I can bring you to where I am now, which is into a loving relationship with God. So we can bring them I think back. I think a lot, of, a lot of parents, I might be wrong, I'm not parents, a lot of parents, I think I heard this from, oh, from Inda, not that he was talking about himself, um, they push things like doctrines and stuff onto their children at such a young age instead of just bringing out of them empathy and love for others. Instead, they press upon them all these rules and regulations and just puts them off and the majority of these kids just turn away. Yeah, yeah, I, but I think, I think at the root of that, it's not that they didn't do it for their best good. I mean, people have rules in the world. You have rules, yeah, there's boundaries. But they didn't know any better because what they've been taught themselves from the age. Exactly, so I think the heart of the question is still, why is it drummed out of the priest? Why don't we as priests understand empathy? Why don't we? And the reason is because Satan, partly, has given us false doctrine and idolatry. And because of that idolatry, the Apis Ball concept has driven out empathy for people. And I think I'm only beginning to see the depths of that as I looked at this question this week, because I'm thinking, I don't think we fully understand. I mean, we priests, we know the golden rule. We know do unto others. Conservative Adventists know that. They know do unto others as you want people to do to you. If you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. But they don't understand. Go against your doctrine. What's that? Until they go against the doctrine, and then we fight with them. Yes, you know, until, that, until they go against the doctrine. That's what we've been about the last years, is fighting against those who go against what we say. So we've got a concept of these things, and we want to thrust it on people. We want to train them in it. We want them to believe as we do. We want them to see it as we do. So we've got this false view of God as apostate Christians, and then we put it on people. And we don't understand that the whole model of Christianity we have accepted, the apist bull we have, is actually destroying empathy for people. It actually sets us up to hate instead of love. And I don't think we still fully realise that as conservatives because we've still got this mindset, as we've learned, the character of the apostate Protestants because we don't fully believe that these people are that bad. It's not that bad. It can't be that bad. The idol we have is not as bad as the, you know, um, the Israelites sacrificing their children, for instance. That's just horrific. You know, but we're not quite that bad. We don't really see the depths of it. So I don't think parents have done anything different from what the priests have done. I think we've just accepted a conservative mindset. We've tried to put that on the children, our view of what we think God is like, what's right and what's wrong. We put that on the children. One, they're too young to handle it, so their mindset doesn't process it properly. So, but actually, it does process it quite properly because it comes out in hatred, and that's exactly what we've got. And, it, and we see it and we go, whoa, we're not like that. We don't want to kill Trump. We just think he's a bad president. And they say, no, let's get the guns out and kill him. He's bad. He's, he needs to be wiped out. And we go, you can't speak like that. But they're just manifesting the spirit that we have. And we don't understand how we've got that spirit. I think one of the things is because of this whole concept of education. So this week I've been looking at some TED Talks about education. And one of the things that it says is that the whole education system is geared up in a certain direction. And that direction is to elevate subjects that will get you a good job at the end of it. So they elevate maths and English because you need maths and English in most good paying jobs. So they undermine subjects like history, music, art, um, you know, all the artistic subjects. The sciences and maths and English are elevated because you'll get good paying jobs with that. So our whole system is geared towards um, making money at the end of the day or having a good job. And then and when you see what Ellen White says about our concept to do with that, how we value people, it's directly attached to how much money we have. And so we can see how the whole education system, I'm just trying to put this picture together of, of where, it, where it's going and how we've got into this mess. And I think this is part of it. It's the whole way the educa education system is geared up. When What should education be about? And I think we haven't fully conceptualized that, but, but when you look at the schools of the prophets in Israel, they learn sacred history, they learn sacred music, 
and um, poetry. So if you looked at that, you'd say, actually, they learnt the arts. They didn't learn the sciences, really. They learnt the arts. They learnt sacred history, sacred music, and poetry were three of the key subjects in the schools of the prophets because they need to know who God is. And he's manifest through those subjects, through the arts, perhaps in a greater degree than through the sciences. If, I, I haven't put this all together, but I'm just trying to wrestle with it now. So somehow our whole education system has stamped this out of our children. And I don't think the world does a much better job, but I think they do. But we're in a worse position because we're supposed to be representing God. And we've gone so far wrong because we don't show any better than the world. In fact, we're often worse is what I guess what Elder Pelinda was bringing up. So let's go and see how how we've got to this position. Go on. Um, yeah, I think that's a very good point you've made. Um, in terms of what we value and what we elevate and not, um, and there's a lot of just that thing um, that should be really elevated. Um, there's a lot of... Okay, let, let, no, no, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, just say that last bit again. There's a lot of... It, it was cracking up. No, I, 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 I kind of stopped because I didn't know how to edit, so okay. I'm going to rephrase it. I'm just going to rephrase it. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, I, I'm doing a PhD in, 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 in a scientific area. Whenever anyone hears that I do, like, a PhD, they're like, oh, wow, da, 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 da. You know, they really give you a lot more respect because you're doing something with them. But when I was doing um, support work, you know, I found that so much more valuable than me tinkering. You know, I, when I'm in the lab, I'm just kind of tinkering in the lab, just finding this, doing this and doing that. Kind of on my own, I'm not really directly benefiting anybody. Well, directly, I mean, eventually down the line, hopefully it would. But then in support work, the way people care for the people they're supporting is so important. It's so, it makes a huge difference, you know, how much effort you the show, what they do, you know, even just the way you care for somebody. You know, you really put yourself in the shoes and you really, and it's, it's tough because you have to do some, some very unpleasant things, you know, when you have to do some, cleaning and feeding and, and basically you're, you're doing everything for this person. I, I, for me personally, I, I think that's a, of a lot more value. I'm, I'm not saying that science is not of value, but I see science as secondary to, first of all, having that support and and pay. And, and, and I, I think I just said that, you know, people doing these jobs are, are very lowly paid. In fact, there's sort of some really good care uh, support workers had to leave because they just weren't getting enough enough pay, and, and for me that was very sad because it's kind of like we flipped it on its head, where things that um, you know things like STEM. I, th I heard someone made, I heard this phrase is we should use things and love people, but we love things and use people. So, 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 so when when people are making things, we value them more than the people who do things for others, if that makes sense, we, we still have a higher value on that. We don't have empathy for one another. Exactly, yeah, so we use, um, so we should use things to help people, but we use people. What was it? Say it again? No, we're supposed to use things and love people, yeah. but we love things and use people. And I think also the, I mean, Tom made a good point there, and I think because, you know, uh, uh, education also has an arrogance of being more educated, so I'm not like that person. Like he, like Tom just made a really good point of when he says he's, he's, he's starting to be a PhD, he has more respect. And uh, so the, the poorer people, the ones that do display this empathy and do display this compassionate spirit, is not really in everybody that's really educated. Yeah. I'm not saying it isn't, but mm -hmm. it's it's more so in the in the in the in the poorer ones. You know, like we had Jesus uh, um, cleansing the temple, and all the leaders ran out, and all the lame, the blind, the poor, they were left behind. So you can see the disparity there in people who are supposed to be educated leaving, and the what, poor. What's he just saying? I'll come in to say about people who are more highly educated. They tend not to look. God or for religion, right. and that's one of the reasons. Because at the root of it, they want to make everybody. Sorry, they want to make everybody. 
um, you know, if you look back at um, certain senates and different people who are talking about education is good and stuff, it's because they lose, they get too busy, they lose track of, um, yeah, they, they, you're less likely to look for God, you're, you're on a high wage, you're doing well in life, you're not really wanting to pray, um, it's suffering that brings you closer to God. So we've got this battle between false education and true education, so I'm going to put false education here, which is the world's education, basically will elevate degrees, PhDs, all those things. The more education you have, the better it is, because the better job you can get and the more money you can have. So this is more money and status and etc. You have um, 30 minutes. Okay. And the more pride, I just put pride is directly correlated to this education. So pride, which leads to oppression, hatred, um, all those other things that we see, which is the opposite of love. So true education should enable us if they had a continual increase of knowledge with Adam and Eve, it should have enabled them to love more, to love God more, and to love each other more. And it, the opposite is true of false education. It leads you to actually oppress and hate your brother without realizing it. And that's the worst thing. Because I think one of the things this has done is set up the white Western world as the supremacy. White supremacy goes along with education. Because the Western countries with the more money, the more affluent ones, have the higher degrees, the more education you get from them, so a flood of people come to America, to England, to Europe to get trained, to get good jobs, money, more money to send back home to help the poor. Um, and all that just perpetuates white domination and white supremacy on one level. And I think that's what we've just imbibed in Christianity. We're just a reflection of the society we're in. So we elevate the things that the world elevates, which is money, status, um, color of skin, all those things are on top in white evangelical America. And that filters into Christianity. So then you get this prosperity thing, this prosperity gospel, which I think links to why Christians now want to get involved in politics, because they want a temporal kingdom which is prosperous and highly educated and full of money and has a headship model and has all those conservative principles in it, which just, they want to create their kingdom on earth. And that's what we see in the white evangelical circles. It's the kingdom is kingdom theology. It's setting up a government that's going to endorse these values. And that's that conflict between the Democrats and Republicans, it should be, or between, you know, between this system and then and what true education should really be about. So because Satan understood that increase of knowledge is what we need. We need education. We need true education because the more educated you would be, in, you're the more effective you would be as a missionary if it was true education, the more effective you would be to reflect God's character because you'd know more about him. And Ellen White talks about this, the science of true education is the science of redemption. It's the science of how to be saved, which is how to be restored into the image of God. So true education would then say, um, image of God would be here. And this is love. So the more true education you get, the more you would reflect the image of God and the more love you would have and the happier you would be. So this is true happiness. But Satan seeks to obliterate that picture and say that happiness will come from false education. So the more educated you are, the more money you have, the happier you will be. The more property you own, the more things you have, the more things you have, the happier you will be. But we realize the more people you love, the happier you will be. So it's a complete contrast. The two seem to be at loggerheads with each other. When the Constitution of America, I was trying to think about that as well, it says you have the right to liberty, to, um, what is it? The right to liberty, life, and the, uh, owning, owning property. <laughs> God. So those things are life, good. Life, liberty, right? and the pursuit of happiness. And the pursuit of happiness. And they risk, what did they say? Instead of pursuit of happiness, they say the right to own property. That's another way you can put it. And the yeah. reason, but what is the reason for owning the property? The reason is so you can have a space where people can learn to love, a family that can grow and nurture. Other people can come in. You can have hospitality. You can have a place which is a safe place that you can call yours where you can develop your theology, which should have been to reflect the love of God. Very similar to the Abraham model. So Abraham had families following him. They all followed Abraham. He was kind of like the leader over them all. But he was a teacher, an instructor of righteousness. So he taught the families and the fathers of the families how to train their children to love God. So each family was its own school. That's what Ellen White said. And I think that's the closest model we would have, we have to how the earth would have been populated. And that as everybody went out, Adam perhaps would have been over everyone as he lived longest and he knew more. 
and they would have gone to him for counsel on different things, for information, but it wasn't a hierarchical dictatorship, it was a, a shared responsibility, and everybody would have grown in their knowledge of God and of love. But what's happened is, Satan's come in and he wants to misrepresent all these things, so now he's elevating the right to own property, and, and the reason to own property, so we can be better than the Joneses, so we can have more, and we can be happier if we have more, and it's, it's a delusion. And, and it, yeah, so it's, full, it's bought into this system of false education. So that crushes out empathy for people because to have more, someone else has to have less. So you have to step on people to get to where you need to get and other people will suffer. And that whole system has been perpetuated throughout the earth. And so now what we've got is this system which actually puts people on top of other people, which is why the headship model is so ugly because someone's on top and someone's underneath. And that usually leads to oppression and slavery, which is what we see in marriages. So this is why we have to get rid of equality, because we need, sorry, not equality, we have to get rid of oppression and um, inequality, because it, it crushes out empathy. So this is what we learned last week as well. We quoted from the Millerite history, and we saw how in the Millerite history their test was slavery, the fugitive slave law. And Ellen White talks about the fugitive slave law, and she says, it was designed to crush out sympathy. So we can see that the noble something principle of sli I think you remember, I keep wanting to memorize that quote. Um, I just want the exact words. Anyway, it was designed to crush out sympathy for human beings. And so we know that to pass the test, they have to have sympathy for human beings if, that's the, op if the opposite is true. And by doing compare and contrast, we can say they were tested on whether they had sympathy for human beings. So their test was empathy. And I think this is our test. Empathy is going to be our test. And it connected to equality and understanding this process of education. So let's go to Christ Object Lessons 34.4. I just want to read this quote. So I'm going to get rid of this. And I think this is something that we're going to pick up in our Friday night studies from now on. We're probably going to shift gears to this topic. Because I think there's a lot in Spirit, Prophecy and Bible that we can glean from these stories about this subject. So let's go to Christ Object Lessons, 34.4, and I think it's paragraph 5 as well. Um, but there's some really good principles in this section, a 35.1. And someone posted, please, in the forum. 35.1 as well. The chat. Yes, I can do that. Um, so bearing in mind that we get to Christ time, so just before we go here, let's see if we can... Actually, maybe we'll go here first and then we'll link it to our models of ancient Israel and see how it li links with line upon line. So there it is. So I want to get through this one. If we don't, I don't know, I think I might be taking divine service, but if I'm not, we'll carry on this. If I don't finish it, which I don't think I'm going to finish it today because this is an ongoing study, we can pick it up next week, um, Friday, hopefully. So... Let's read this one then. So I was just to let you know the um, the quote is, is yeah. kind of been chopped off. Oh, so it depends on what, it depends on what, what part you want to read from. Okay, I'm going to read I'm going to read the whole thing, but I'll just pull out something. Um, so uh, where did it go to? Okay, answered heaven is at hand. Okay, so I'll just try and get that last bit posted from the, the second to last sentence again. Okay, that should be all of it now. Hopefully, it might just overlap by one sentence there. So, let's have a look at this. I'm just going to read it from here. Christ's mission was not understood by the people of his time. So Christ comes to do a work in his history and he's the second angel and we have a second angel in our history comes to do a work and the work is not understood. He's not understood. The message of the hour, which is Christ is the Messiah and he's going to set up a kingdom and he's a king. What kind of king is he? What kind of kingdom is he setting up? They didn't understand his mission. Just like we don't understand what type of the nature of the kingdom in our history and how it's going to, wait, how it's going to work. Um, 
The manner of his coming was not in accordance with their expectations. And we could say they were looking for a certain thing to happen. They were looking for a certain things they had to go through. They were looking for a king to set up a kingdom, overthrow the Romans. And their whole expectation of prophecy was wrong. And I'm going to say as is wrong. So our whole expectation of prophecy is to see a Sunday law. And we recognise that in our build-up of our message that we're not going to see a Sunday law. So our whole message is wrong. Our whole understanding of it is wrong. And it was the same for them. The Lord Jesus was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Its imposing services were of divine appointment. They were designed to teach the people that at the time appointed, one would come to whom those ceremonies pointed. But the Jews had exalted the forms and ceremonies and had lost sight of their object. So another way we could put that, maybe another way we could put that is, Christ was the foundation of the Jewish economy. So here he's coming as a suffering servant now. He's coming as a lamb to go to the slaughter. And their whole system should have taught them that. So he's given them truth in the Old Testament. They've got, they've got a message from the Old Testament that was all correct, that they should have understood. So there's, there's, there's a message there they should have understood in a certain light. We've got the whole Old Testament and, we, and the, let's say, Spirit of Prophecy writings. And there's a message there we should have understood in a certain light. And we haven't understood it in the right way and neither did they. The whole message was designed to teach them that these ceremonies pointed towards something. So it was a parable and it was pointing to something else. That they had exalted the forms and ceremonies or the thing itself, the parable itself, and had lost sight of their object. They lost sight of the principle behind it. They lost sight of the purpose of why they were doing those forms and ceremonies. They're doing all the right things outwardly, but they'd lost the purpose behind it. They lost the principle. So we come along and we're doing the same thing. We understand the Sabbath. We're keeping Sabbath. We're dressed with ones. We're doing all the things we've been given, but we don't understand the principle behind it, which is empathy and equality. And they've done the same thing. So they're doing the right things outwardly, but they have exalted the form and ceremony above the principle. Exactly the same. And they had exalted it above love as well. So they put all these ceremonies above the love of God, above Christ coming as a servant, as a loving God, as a saving God, not a destroying God. So the traditions, maxims and enactments of men hid from them the lessons which God intended to convey. So now they've got tradition and maxims and enactments of men. And I'm going to say, okay, we just read that Christ set up that system, that these services were by divine appointment. And now she shifts in this sentence by saying it's traditions of men that have hidden these lessons from them. And I'm going to ask, is it really the traditions of men or is it, it is God's traditions, but they've elevated the things that God has given them and misinterpreted them in the wrong way. And they've added human teaching to it. But even when he comes along and he says, you know, they're tithing, mint and cumin. And he says, these things you should have done because he told them to do all that, but not leave the other things undone, not leave love, mercy and justice undone. So I think when it says elevated the words of men, maybe we could put in there the traditions of dead men. Um, they've, they're, they're not reading dispensationally. They're going back to Old Testament, reading it as is, thus saith the Lord, and they've elevated that over the principle, over what God's trying to teach them in their living history. So it's hidden from them because they refuse to shift. They're looking at it from a, um, an Old Testament perspective, and they're stuck in that, and they're elevating those laws above the principle, which was the love of God. So these maxims and traditions become an obstacle to their understanding and practice of true religion. So now they've got, thus saith the Lord, they've got these maxims and traditions, which they're mixed up with traditions, which are by divine appointment. They've got the whole ceremonial system. They're doing it all. They're sacrificing the lamb. But they, it's made them cruel. And their view of God is distorted because they've still got an atheist bull concept. They think God's going to come along as a warrior king and kill everyone. He's going to destroy his enemy. And Christ comes and says the opposite. I'm coming. To love my enemy, to save him. Emma? Yes. Yeah, I think Ella White says in there that um, all these ceremonies were meant to point to Christ, who's coming. Exactly. And um, so they were meant to warn, the Jews were meant, the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees were meant to warn the people of that was coming, the, the Savior, yeah, and that's where they went wrong. So then it goes. And it's the same yeah. for our FDA church, really. They were meant to warn the people and then the world. The Christ was coming in the second advent and they didn't do their job. And it's the same for us now. If we get it right, we are meant to warn the church. And exactly, yeah. Sister Emma, you have 15 minutes. Okay. And not get wrapped up in, um, you know, the conservative uh, way of thinking. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think 
we've read this, like traditions, maxims and enactments of men, we've read that to say that they added all these laws in the Talmud, that they said you can't travel a certain distance with, um, you know, without taking a door with you to go through a doorway. You have to carry a doorway so you don't travel too much on Sabbath. You know, they had all these ridiculous rules that they had added on. And we read that and say that's what they did, but we don't do that. But when you look at the context of this sentence, she puts it right in the middle of the fact that God gave them those traditions and those maxims and those enactments. Because now she picks it up again. She says, and when the reality came in the person of Christ, they did not recognize in him the fulfillment of all their types, the substance of all their shadows. So they had types and shadows from God. So they have the type, let's say they have the type here, ceremonial system. And this is the, um, in the Old Testament, and this is the, um, perhaps this, this is the writings of dead men. And they, and when the reality came in Christ, and so now they've got Christ comes in their history, and he says, no, this is who I am, this is what you should have seen, this is how you should have read this, but these lambs equal Christ, and him, and they had just... And they and they've totally disconnected the two, so they have got the mindset of a heathen, and they've approached God's ceremonial system with the mindset of a heathen, which says you have to sacrifice your children to appease this angry God. So they're not seeing this lamb as Christ in the right way. So they're seeing it as an atheist bull concept, as a wrong um, apostate concept, and so they they're doing all the right things outwardly, but they've got the wrong mindset, and so now. They see Christ and they don't recognize that he fulfills all that system, that he is the end of all that system, that this was all supposed to point to him, the love of God, not fear and hatred, which is where they've ended up. Um, and we're doing Because the they exalted forms and ceremonies, just like the Assyrian church, they exalted the reforms and stuff, and persecuted them and yeah. oppressing people, really, instead of loving the people, right. and pointing the... The doctrines to Christ. But the forms, them. the forms that they have exalted are not wrong on them on their own. So they've exalted they, the, the right forms. They've lifted this up. They should have done this ceremonial system. Traditions, maxims. When it says in traditions, maxims, and enactments of men, I think we should put in there of dead men. So this is not, so this is still God's. So we, we separate that and we say these are traditions of men that they've added on. But these are not. These are God's traditions that they misinterpreted. So they've got the form, but they haven't got the mindset. So they've got the form that God gave them, but they've lost the character. They forgot got the spirit behind that. Brother Taylor was, uh, Taylor was talking about it uh, back in June, I think. Mm -hmm. That we can keep the things like, for, for example, it's veganism and that stuff, but we can be so vegan and we can forget the spirit behind it so we can like eat wrongly and that stuff. So it's important to know the spirit behind of the things. Right, and this is what we've done with all our doctrines. So with them, they had a form, they followed the form, but they lost the character or the mindset. And so they've separated the two. And this is what Satan wants us to do with this, with idolatry. So he wants us to have, if we've got one of them wrong, we've got it wrong. But obviously they have both wrong, but then if they get the mindset wrong and they change the form, it's still no good. So now Christ comes along and he says, I'm going to change the form, we're not doing this anymore. But because they've got the wrong spirit, they can't accept him. And so they say, no, actually, we're going to crucify you because you're not saying what we thought this meant. Because we've got the wrong we've got the wrong mindset, even though we're doing all the outward form. And I think that's what we're seeing with conservative Adventism. We have the wrong form and we have the wrong mindset. And so now we're changing the form and we need to change the mindset with it. It has to go hand in hand, otherwise we're going to end up in the same position there in which is lost and undone. So but I think it's really important for us to realise these are not man additions or man made things. This is a misreading of God's word, of God's traditions and God's maxims, because we've just accepted what dead men have said about it instead of living men. So we have elevated the dead men over the living. And that's what we do all the time. So we say we've got enough truth, all we see is what there is. Sorry, what we see is all there is. And that's and we stop learning and growing because we accept dead men over living men. And I think that's what we've done. So and and that's why they're walking dead. They're not alive because they haven't got the right spirit of Christ. They haven't got the right mindset. They're dead. They're walking in the traditions of their fathers in the same mindset because so they're the same their copies, their images of their fathers instead of the image of the true God. And so when the reality comes in the person of Christ, they don't recognize him as the fulfillment of the types and shadows. They rejected the antitype and clung to their types and useless ceremonies. So they cling to the form, cling to form, and 
then reject the antichrist or the fulfillment of that of, so, and they reject Christ basically they reject God in that history they reject the true messenger of the hour the living messenger um, the son of God had come but they continued to ask for a sign so when you cling to the form now you ask for a sign and that's why Christ says no sign is going to help you because if I give you a sign you've got the wrong mind you will misinterpret the sign so then you'll see the sign and it won't help you because your mindset's wrong and you need to be willing to shift your mindset because you've not understood why you're doing this. And this is... Yeah, Elder Tess said she, did, she, even if she gave two signs to the movement to those who are asking for one now. Yeah, it wouldn't help. It's just like when Jesus says, though one rose from the dead, you would not believe. Because one did rise from the dead. He was even called Lazarus in the parable and they didn't get the parable. So what they've done here is they've made the parable the truth instead of seeing what the parable is supposed to teach them. So they're standing in the parable and they're, they're, they're rejecting the understanding of that parable, or the reason behind the parable, the principle behind it, what it's trying to teach them. Um, the message, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They answered by demands for a miracle. The gospel of Christ was a stumbling block to them because they demanded signs instead of a saviour. So now you've got signs. Versus a saviour. And if you look at the root of that, what does that actually mean? So the saviour requires a cross, requires empathy, love, sympathy, um, because he's come to save you from sin and to save people, which is to treat people with empathy, um, service, self-sacrifice, ultimately death on the cross. And nobody wants it. Nobody wants that kind of work. They want signs, and signs will show power, Dominion, um, king. king, king has signs and wonders because he can do miracles. So even though Christ does miracles in that history, what's the purpose of the miracle? The purpose of the miracles is always to save someone, to restore them to the image of God. He does all this healing because he's concerned about the individual. These people, they want to do the miracles to show how great they are. So this is all about self. And that's why... God can't give us signs right now because we've still got a big bull and we wouldn't use it right. And so we need to get to this position, which is death, <laughs> um, which is really life, which is the ironic thing because in this history they're dead and he's alive and we don't want the, the path to life because it, it's a cross. It's the cross. Um, the gospel of Christ was a stumbling block to them because they demanded signs instead of a saviour. They expected the Messiah to prove his claims by mighty deeds of conquest. So this is deeds of conquest. To establish his empire on the ruins of earthly kingdoms. This expectation Christ answered in the parable of the sower. Not by force of arms, not by violent interpositions was the kingdom of God to prevail but by the implanting of a new principle in the hearts of men. So now we've got a king, which is what they wanted, Apis Ball. I'm going to put Apis Ball. Versus a sower. <laughs> and it's in complete contrast. When we do compare and contrast, let's just finish this because she does that a little bit. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Christ had come not as a king, but as a sower. So we've got king versus sower. And then she says, not for the overthrow of kingdoms, but for the scattering of seed. So she does overthrow kingdom. Versus scatter seed. And not to point his followers to earthly triumphs and national greatness. Earthly triumphs and national greatness. But to a harvest. And that is to be gathered after patient toil through losses and disappointments. So this is patient toil.
losses and disappointments. I don't know if you can still see that, can you? No. <laughs> Not on the screen. Yeah, okay. So, and this is fundamental to our understanding of what's going on in our history. So, I want us to see what can we learn from that? How would we translate that now? Does anybody want to give any comments on this parable? So, we have a king versus a sower. We have overthrowing kingdoms versus scattering seed. And we have earthly triumphs and national greatness versus harvest of patient toil with losses and disappointments. And we have uh, less than five minutes, about three minutes. Okay. So let's round it up here then. And I think, and I'll double check if I'm doing the next service. If we if we are, we can pick it up next service. If I'm not, um, we'll do it next Friday because there's a lot more I need to share on this topic. Um, we want to go through now and look at Adam, look at Eden to Eden and see what, as Eden, Adam was given to do and how this is going to develop the right spirit in us. So I'm going to say here that this is, if we put this, the king versus the sower, that what the role of a king is to have dominion, is to rule with power, is to overthrow his enemies and to kill his enemies. If we look at this, overthrow kingdoms basically means um, death and killing because usually they went in and they killed everyone. Um, Sounds like the uh, king of the north over the 144,000. The king of the north wants to overthrow yeah. the whole world and uh, God's people, 144,000, do this. Very interesting this as well, when you think about this. Uh, there's more to this parable because when you look at the king of the north in scripture, Babylon, when you see what Nebuchadnezzar did, it's actually contrary to some of this. Um, but that's another story, so <laughs> just bear that in mind when looking at this. But most of the time, earthly kings went to overthrow the kingdom by death and killing and showing dominion. Here, scattering seed is what? It's implanting life. When you scatter seed, you want life to come forth and spring forth and grow. But it's a painstaking work. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a patient, as we learned here, patient toil. So when you scatter those seeds, they start dead. They're dead first, and then they're going to come to life. But this is a... So this is a new implanting principle that's going to take place in the hearts of the believers. And I'm going to say this principle that God needs to show so in our hearts is empathy. So Christ has come now to sow seeds of empathy in the heart of the believer, implant, and to produce people after his kind. So he wants to save people in this model. Here they want to kill people, here he wants to save people. Earthly triumphs and national greatness versus a harvest. So here, it's about oppression over other people, destruction of people, with a few minority on top. And um, this is very much echoing the, the, you know, what's going on in America, making make it great. Um, similar apostate Protestantism, a few people are made great. Headship model, one person's over. Slavery. The whole principle is some a few over the majority, and it's all earthly. There's nothing spiritual about it. Whereas this is spiritually harvesting souls who are spiritual, who love God, and who are part of his kingdom. And it's going to be a painstaking work. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not through force and oppression. It takes time. And it takes time to educate people, increase of knowledge. And there's going to be lots of loss and disappointment, just like there's loss and disappointment here. But it's okay because it's the enemy. But you might lose some on your side as well. So there is loss and disappointment, I think, this side. But it looks different. So the world see this as failure. So when Christ dies on the cross, all hopes are dashed. The whole thing is destroyed. The, the people are looking on going, the whole mission's failed. Even the disciples think the whole mission's failed. So it looks like it's failed because they're dead. But now he's going to come back to life. Resurrection happens over here. Um, this one looks successful because they march in and do their thing and stand up with the banners. But ultimately it's death because we know it's not spiritual life. It's hate and killing and fear over love. So we really have to understand these concepts and these principles in order to develop this empathy and to change our minds. Our minds need changing, we need to have our minds renewed in this history and unless we do that we're not going to pass the test and we're not going to be part of God's kingdom. So in summary, we're basically getting to the place where we're seeing what we need to learn in our history. So we're heading towards understanding what the test is for us and we know it's to do with empathy. Um, from the previous camp meeting I'm saying it's to do with empathy. And we know also that um, Elder Tess said it was about marriage. So we're going to pick that up in the next session about 
looking at some of the Bible characters of how this has manifested in them, how they've kept on, you know, how they've had an atheist born, how their mindset's been changed, how has their mindset, mindset been changed, how has Adam, Moses, Christ, and in Christ's time, what's it looked like in the time of Paul, um, how they moved from wanting to kill people to wanting to save them, basically, the spirit of hatred to the spirit of love and empathy. And so the way we're going to get there, we've seen in our history, is we need an increase of knowledge. It's on good and evil. So there are things to learn and unlearn. So this is good and evil. So we have to identify the, the difference in the conspiracy theories and the two streams. We have the word, but it's how we espouse. So it's dispensational. We're going to put dispensation even. So we have to understand the difference between the dead and the living. Put a dead and living. Dead versus living. So it's okay to have the dead writers, and we should resurrect the dead writers, but we have to do it in terms of the living today. So we have to understand the dead in terms of the living messenger today. And we have to change our minds. We have to go from the character and the form. We have to change the form and the character. So this is the outer and the inner man. This is this is in our dispensation we're saying we have to go from having this spirit of nationalism, racism and homophobia to a spirit of empathy and salvation for others and a care for other people. And it's a basic understanding of the gospel and it's taken us a huge prophetic route as a movement to get here. But God has to put all that information in place for it to be effective, for it to be truly the love of God that's going to be lifted up in this message. So let's close there and then if you've got any thoughts or questions maybe we can pick it up next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of getting to know who you are. We thank you for the privilege of being part of this movement. Um, we have suffered, many of us have suffered what we feel might be losses and disappointments in this journey. We have seen friends fall off. We've seen loved ones walk away from the light and the truth. But we pray for each one of us bowed before you that we would not do that, that we would be willing to pick up the cross and follow you whithersoever you lead us. We know that these are momentous times in earth's history. We know that soon the harvest is coming, the harvest of the earth is ripe, that there are people out there who are just waiting for us to harvest them. But we're not ready, Lord, and we pray that you would have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins where we've held a wrong concept of who you are, where we've bought into the lies of Satan, where we have idolatry in our hearts, an apis bull, an apostate Protestant view of you, which is wrong, Lord, and it's satanic. We pray that you would purge us of these wrong thoughts and feelings, that you would educate us in the right direction, that you would lead us to the sources we need to see and read, to the people we need to meet, and that we might learn empathy, that you might give it to us, that we might see how to develop it in ourselves and in our children. Please be with us now for the rest of this Sabbath day. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.